Hey everybody, Pastor Kevin here. Thanks for joining us online. Practicing the way is the series we're in. We're in week seven, and I want to talk to you about doing as Jesus did. We, we looked at it uh, a couple weeks ago, and I want to look at a second part of this. Just what does it mean to demonstrate the gospel practically by serving as Jesus did? Because as his apprentices, that's what we're called to do. And so uh, and I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been in a desperate situation? Have you ever been desperate? Now, as a, you know, as a teenager, maybe you were desperate for a date. Maybe uh, as you get older, maybe you're, you have a desperate financial situation or you're desperate for a job or, uh, you know, and, and that word gets used a lot, but it's, uh, you know, desperate many times means like a hopeless situation, a really difficult situation. I know I've had some, I know you've had some. We're going to be looking at a story today in Mark 9. And uh, that's where we're going to be primarily. But I've got a few verses I want to give you ahead of that. But let me do a little recap with you. Because in this series, uh, we've been talking about three big goals of being an apprentice of Jesus. And here's the big goals. Be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and do as Jesus did. Be with him, become like him, and do as he did. And the order is important because if we just go to the third one, which we're going to cover today, do as Jesus did, without being with him, without becoming like him, uh, we can get burnt out, we can get crispy, we can get, um, yeah, it's unhealthy. But when we're with Jesus, we're, we're being with him on a regular basis. Because remember, this is about a relationship with the living God who loves us and knows us. And we want to be with our rabbi. We want to be with him first. And from that place of relationship and health, then healthy doing and healthy maturing can happen. And so that's why it's so key. And that's so important. And I want to remind, because we can get caught up in doing. And sometimes we're wired to be doers. And, and we can get so focused on doing that we forget to get recharged and energized by being with Jesus. And so that's so key. And we've been looking at some practices uh, in this series each week and nine practices over the series we'll, we'll cover. And there's, there's more than we could talk, more than that we could talk about. But for this series, we're doing nine of them. And today's practice um, is service. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you that key practice. It's, it'll be on the screen for you. And then I want to talk to you about the spiritual formation triangle that we've been looking at this process of, of that. And so let's look at the practice. It says, uh, today's practice is service. It's taking on the nature of Jesus and, and joyfully putting others before yourself in order to minister to their need without any expectation of recognition or reward. That one of the key, just leave that up there for you, one of the key ways that we uh, do what Jesus did and and engage with others right get the good news out loving and serving and blessing others is through this this practice called service so as you work in that practice into your regular rhythms you're looking for ways you're praying for ways to engage people practically and so let's look at the the spiritual formation uh, triangle here uh, because we've been talking about the teaching we've been talking about doing that uh, getting truth in us and then looking at community and then also uh, the practices and so I just mentioned one of those practices to you serve We've talked about fasting. We've talked about others. Community is one of those as well. And so by working those practices into our regular rhythm with truth, uh, worked out in community, and, and then you'll notice that, in, that the middle triangle there says the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is the one who empowers us to do all that we're called to do and be. And so it's such a beautiful picture, but this takes time. It's a slow process. Um, and really, we could also say it this way when we, we've talked about the three legged stool, this transformation process. We've talked about learning things about God and learning truth from Scripture and then obeying those things that we learn and then also sharing those. And so really, it's almost another way to look at this triangle. It's like we're learning truth, right? And then we're walking in obedience in community. And then thirdly, we're sharing that with others. That's that doing what Jesus did. So uh, one of the things I was thinking about just to celebrate with you is that this last couple weeks ago, we celebrated three years uh, at Lapway for our, with our dinner church. And it was, we had a great celebration. And then last two weeks ago, we launched our, a soft launch of our fourth dinner church on G Street down at the Lewiston Community Center. We had 40 guests that came from the neighborhood, a uh, bunch of volunteers, about 20 volunteers. So it was a great night. And I just want to say, yeah, God, go as we plant these 30 churches by 2030 that God's called us to do. It's so exciting. And, and it's one of the practical things about dinner church is so many people, those volunteers are there practicing this practice called service, right? They're, they're 
making meals, they're uh, serving the meal, they're investing relationally in others, some are doing some worship, and clean up, set up, all of it, and just building connection. They're doing the things Jesus did in this area of service. And so it's very practical. It's a practical way to demonstrate the good news of Jesus. And so uh, let's get to the big idea of today's message. It's the end goal of any apprentice of Jesus or a disciple of Jesus is to carry on the work of their mentor. And of course, Jesus is our mentor. And so we want to carry on his work. And that means we want to do what he did. Just like if you're an apprentice electrician, eventually you want to be able to wire a house on your own and be a full-blown journeyman electrician, right? Same with Jesus. We want to do what he did. Now, last week, uh, we had Bill Clem as a special guest, and, and he preached a, just a phenomenal message. And, uh, but there was a passage he used in 1 Corinthians 2, 9 to 11, and it says this. Uh, it says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. But it was to us that God revealed these things. How? By his Spirit, for his Spirit searches out everything and shows us uh, God's deep secrets. Now, he went all the way to verse 16, and verse 16 talks about the mind of Christ, that, that we have the mind of Christ, and that the Spirit is the one who reveals those truths of who Jesus is and, and what he knows, and, and how and he does that, he reveals that by his Spirit. But it's this, this word here, uh, no, this word imagine, that really jumped out at me. I, just, I want you just to think about that for a second. No mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. And so I want to say to you, uh, today that I want, I want you to think and I want you actually by, by the Spirit to imagine what those good works might be. <laughs> what might those good works be that he's prepared for you and I to do for the, says for those who love him. If you're, if you're a believer in Jesus, if you surrender your life to him, he's got things he's set up and I can imagine pretty big and I know you can too, but it's bigger than that. That means, and we know Ephesians 2.10, right? I don't have it on the screen for you, but it says God's prepared good works in advance for us to do. He has good deeds, good works for us. And as a matter of fact, even John 14, 12 to 14, it's there for you. It says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I have done. This is Jesus speaking, and even greater works. Because I'm going to the Father, and you can ask for anything in my name, and I'll do it so that the Son will bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Incredible. And then Mark 16, 15 says, And then he told them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. And, and, and the verb tense there with, those, with the words, Go into all the world, it's a unique verb tense. And it basically means, as you are going into all the world, as you are going, as you're on your way, as you're doing life, as you're at work and, and these, you're doing your hobbies and you're in your neighborhood and you're enjoying your family and as you're doing life, preach the good news. Bring me, bring Jesus with you everywhere you go and do it with eyes wide open to recognize and see the opportunities God's giving you and me to do the things that Jesus is up to. And I love what Jesus said. He said, I'm always about my father's business. And I tell you, one of the things that's so key, and if you wake up every morning and go, God, I know you've got good works prepared in advance, and I can imagine uh, I can imagine some of those works, but I can't even think and fathom the ones that you're you, that are bigger than I'm even thinking. And so, God, I'm but I'm available for those. I'm available for those. So I want to stir. I'm praying the Holy Spirit stirs you up today to go. Wait, today is a great day. It's an adventurous day. It's a day God's got good works prepared. There's things I'm supposed to lean into it, and. And so I want to ask you to have a situational awareness greater every day to go, God, help me have the Holy Spirit radar on. What are you up to today? I want to be about your business. What you're up to today? I've got good works that I know I'm called to, so help me pay attention. And I actually think that a desperation for God for his ways, for these works, for him that comes out of knowing him, being with him, becoming like him, you start to see, wait, I'm on this planet for purpose and a mission. God, to get your the good news out there for you to, for other people to experience the love that I've experienced in Christ. And I get to be that conduit for him. Incredible. And so pay attention uh, to your hungers, hunger. Pay attention and ask God to give you a deeper hunger. Ask him to give you uh, notice the places where you're desperate, 
but also the places where you see other people are desperate. Those, those are clues. Or where, where are their problems? Where are their needs? Uh, where, where do you have a sense of compassion for someone? And, and, and because Jesus is, is always doing things, right? And so, but, but every day, what's he up to? And then how do you partner with him in it is the key. And I believe God will stir our faith where there's a problem or a need. And Jesus wants to meet it that day. And he wants to meet it through you, right? Because there's... There's always a lot of needs, but what's the one he's got set up for you to do and be a part of that day, each day? Those good works, he's prepared, right? And so, it's so key. And so I was thinking about just the amazing things that happened to the disciples, the first disciples, the first apprentices of Jesus, and how he stirred their faith. And and we're going to be, as I mentioned, in Mark. And so let me look at a couple verses, but I'll just give you a little summation here. Some of the things the disciples had seen were incredible, right? The feeding of the 5,000, right? Few few fishes, few loaves, and boom, over 5,000 people fed. Incredible. They were able to distribute it. As, as, it's just this creative miracle is happening, and they're feeding all these people. And uh, they... Jesus heals a blind man, um, in, in, and in, in chapter 7, he heals a deaf man with a speech impediment, and he does it crazily. Look at this passage in Mark 7, 32 to 35. It says, deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him. People begged Jesus to lay his hands on the man to heal him, and Jesus led him away from the crowd so they could be alone. So he kind of pulls him aside. He put his fingers into the man's ears, then spitting on his own fingers, he touched the man's tongue. Yeah. And then said, looking up to heaven, he sighed and said... Apatha, which means be opened, and instantly the man could hear perfectly and his tongue was freed so he could speak plainly. Now, I just imagine if I was one of the disciples and I was there, I was trying to put myself in that position to go, what would, it be, what would that have been like? I mean, it would have been incredible because you're like this man who, who, who couldn't hear, right? And, and, uh, and, and he couldn't speak and, and boom, instantly he's healed but with just this, you know, finger in the ear, touch of the tongue, spitting on your fingers and touching a tongue. Now, I don't know if the, uh, you know, the disciples were like taking notes and were like, oh, that's a unique technique. Okay. I need to spit on my fingers, touch the tongue. (laughs) I need to put my finger in their ear. They had to have been paying attention. They had to have been taking notes at some level and going, oh, that's how you do it. That's how you do it. And uh, it doesn't say that in the passage, but I'm thinking if I was there, I would have been really leaning in. I mean, this is, you would have been paying attention and um and then and then i'm supposed to look to heaven and then boom there's a healing right and so but they the point here is that they have experienced so many cool things so many miracles and miraculous things and so they're growing in their their godfidence of going okay i i we're, we're his apprentices, so we're supposed to be learning this, and we're supposed to be growing in this. And I'm gonna get, we're going to get to do this too, more. We're participating kind of pre-proxy, and we're watching, and we're helping a bit. And now we're going to start doing it eventually here. And so we get to Mark 9, and the context here is, is verse 14 to 29 is the main passage we're going to be in for the rest of today. And um, it says... It says this, it says, when the disciples had returned, uh, when they returned to the other disciples, Peter, James, and John were with Jesus up on the mountain, and this is the the, the transfiguration passage where basically Jesus' true identity is revealed to Peter, James, and John. They've had quite the experience. They come back down, and and they walk into the midst of the other disciples, and they saw a large crowd, verse 14, surrounding them, and some teachers of the religious law were arguing with them. And when the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe and they ran to greet him. What is all this arguing about, Jesus asked. And so, so here's the scene and, and the, this, this, you know, I just imagine yourself there. Uh, religious leaders are having this argument. And then all of a sudden, this, this, and here's my first point really is that desperation stirs a hunger for Jesus because on the scene is a crowd, the religious people, the disciples, uh, Jesus is, is, is coming into, he's there as well, but there's also this father and look what happens with this father and verse 17. And this is, the, I, I mentioned the first point, desperation stirs a hunger for Jesus, but let's look at what, who was being stirred. It's the father. It says, one of the men in the crowd spoke up and he says, teacher, I brought my son so you could heal him. He's possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. And whenever the spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. Then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. 
So the father is just explaining, my son, he, he's, there's this desperation. He's like, he, my boy, he's possessed by an evil spirit. And, um, and, and he gets, it, it gets violent, throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth. And, um, and I just can't imagine the desperation of that father. He's like, I brought him here because teacher, I brought him that you would heal him. He's looking at Jesus. I brought him here to heal him. And um, he's mute. He can't speak. He's later. He can't, he can't hear. He can't speak. Now, this situation um, is, is, is different than the one in chapter 7. Because the same manifestation, he can't hear or speak. That was, this, that was a situation in chapter 7. But this situation, the, the, the father says, there's an evil spirit possessing my son. Now, I just want you to know, I don't believe that if someone can't speak or someone can't hear, that it's, that it's always an evil spirit. And that's one of the reasons I read you the chapter, chapter 7 account, a whole different account. Because sometimes that is a, you know, it's, a, it's something that just happens in a broken world, right? There's, there's a physical reason uh, that that can't happen or a chemical reason. But in this situation, there's clearly an evil spirit that has impacted this boy and, and impacted his life from a very young age. And that's the situation that Jesus is going to be dealing with. So I just want to, I think we've got to be careful and be cautious not to label every uh, infirmity or every challenge or every physical ailment or even mental ailment or emotional ailment that is a demon. We've got to be careful not to chase demons. But also, I think in the West, just to balance that, I think we, we need to ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what's help me to be spiritually discerning here. What's going on? Is this, what is this? And how do I pray? Right? And so that's the situation. And this desperation in the father is stirring a hunger for Jesus. And I want to let you know, when you and I are desperate, I believe it can lead us to seek spiritual answers. It can lead us to Jesus. And when you're investing and you're out there demonstrating the gospel, look for people who are in situations. Ask God to lead you to people that are desperate because if there's a hunger that way, yeah, they'll be open to hearing maybe what they wouldn't have been open to if they weren't desperate. Secondly, desperation can help us and can help us be teachable. And look at verse 19 and Jesus says to them, (laughs) he says to them, you faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. <laughs> and uh, this is kind of intense and kind of, I was kind of after I, when I was preparing this, I'm like, oh man, that is kind of intense, Jesus. It feels, you feels a little impatient. Um, it sounds a little, but, but I, I love that Jesus gets intense with them here. I love that he calls them up and Jesus sometimes puts us in situations and allows us to be in situations where what we thought would work. And I can't help but think where the disciples reflecting back on that, that account in chapter 7, where they saw what Jesus did, you know, tongue, finger in the ear, and going, let's just do that, you know, and nothing's working. Nothing's working. And, and here they are. They're like, they're trying, but they're trying to demonstrate the gospel, but it isn't working. And now they're in an argument with the religious leaders. The father's so desperate. Oh, Jesus, finally you're here. And he's, he's like, come on. Now, but sometimes when we get a little loving rebuke from Jesus, are we willing to be teachable? Are we willing to humble ourselves when we're, we're doing something, we're out there going for it, and we're, and we're in situations where we're like, God, I need you. That's what he wants. I need you. I need you to show me. Maybe I was relying on that formula. Maybe I was relying on the old way. <laughs> yeah, be careful. And be teachable is key here. And so, Verse 20, look what it says. It says, so they brought the boy, but when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion and he fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening? Verse 21, Jesus asked the boy's father, he replied, since he was a little boy, since he was a little boy, the spirit often throws him, this is just awful, into the fire or into water trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. I just, I can't imagine being that dad and having your son so desperately bound by this evil spirit to the point that he gets thrown into fire and thrown into water to drown. And, and he's just like, he, the, the spirit tries to kill him. And, and we're, I'm so desperate, Jesus, I'm desperate. Please heal my boy. But look what he says in verse 22. He says, 
have mercy on us, on me, on my boy, and help us, comma, if you can. <laughs> so Jesus gets a little bit of the story, he gets a, bit, a little bit of the background, he engages the Father, uh, and, and, and I, I believe that Jesus, he's, he, as he's hearing the story, his compassion is, he's seeing the desperation, his compassion has grown, and, and he now knows what's, you know, what the Father sees, and he also knows where the faith of the Father is at. Because he had enough faith, the Father had enough faith to bring his boy to Jesus. The disciples try, it's not working, according to, you know, what's happening here in the story, not working the way they were hoping, and the way they had seen it work before. We did what Jesus did before, it isn't working. And then um, Jesus is like, he's, he's, he's re gonna respond here to this statement of the Father, have mercy on us and help us if you can. Verse 23 says, what do you mean, if I can? If I, Jesus says, if I can? Jesus asks, and then his response is this, Jesus, anything is possible if a person believes. Anything is possible if the person believes. So he's, he's challenging uh, the, the, the faith level of the Father, and I believe the, of the disciples who are there listening as well, as the crowd, this is all happening, remember the crowd, there's the religious leaders there, there's the crowd there, there's the disciples there, there's the Father there, there's the boy there. Anything is possible if a person believes. And if we're willing in our desperation, in our observations to see and be willing to evaluate where we're at, God, do I really trust you? Jesus, do I really believe you? Do I, it, it, am I, it, it, and maybe my faith is here, but are you calling me up? Are you, you know, if you can, the Father's statement, if, if you can, He's, Jesus is saying, if I can, well, anything is possible for those who believe. So he's, he's calling the Father up. He's calling the disciples up because he knew they had some faith. They prayed for the boy, but it didn't work. The, you know, it wasn't, the freedom wasn't coming as a result. And so it isn't that they had no faith. They had some faith, but God is always pulling us up. He's always stretching our faith. He's always calling us to a greater measure of faith. And I believe that's what's, and he's asking us, he's asking this question and making the statement rather, anything is possible if a person believes, which makes you reflect, am I dependent? Am I really, do I really believe God? Am I really dependent on God fully? I think it's an invitation to draw them closer. The Father, to trust Jesus, to trust that it can happen. And, and to see, am I, do I have any doubt here? And then, I love the Father's response. It, verse 24, the Father instantly cries out, and he says, I do believe, but help my overcome my unbelief. I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. This desperation is, is really this third point, is that desperation leads to greater faith. Desperation leads to a greater faith. Don't be afraid of being desperate. Pay attention to where you're desperate. And as you're out ministering to others and helping others and taking the good news out there, as you go, pay attention to those situations. Listen to the language. Listen to where people are at when you're having casual conversations and, and it moves to a meaningful place where they're, they tell you about something they're struggling with or someone they know who's struggling with. It gives you an opportunity to see and exercise greater faith. And I love that the father is so honest because he obviously had faith to bring his boy, but then he's wrestling with this unbelief. And I love how the New Living translated it. It says, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. He's acknowledging, I do have doubt. I do struggle to believe or to see, because my boy has been this way his whole life. He's been bound. He, I've seen so many awful things. So my history and my experience, it's hard to overcome all those things. And I don't know about you guys, but I, God has been challenging me. I believe, Jesus. I believe. I do. And I've seen so many cool things that God's done through others, through me, through the church here. And I, I believe. I've seen it. I know about it. I've read it. I believe, but help my unbelief. Help me overcome it. 
Help me overcome those areas of doubt. Help me trust you. Take me to the next level, Jesus. And I love the Father's response, and I, I really believe it's, it's, it's something for you to pay attention to, something for me to pay attention to today. Help me, um, help me overcome, help me grow, stretch me as I'm being with you, Jesus, as I'm becoming like you, and as I'm doing what you did. Would you stretch me? Would you grow me? Would you bring me to that next level of faith? We need it. You and I need it, but more than that, we need it. Why? We need it because other people need it. (laughs) People need Jesus. They need to see the good news of the gospel demonstrated. And I was thinking about this as, as I was thinking, you know, about how faith grows and how it's grown in my life. And, and I know for me personally, like I've, I've had the privilege of leading lots of people to Christ, like seeing people go from after planting seeds and watering seeds, people going from, you know, just this year, multiple people. I've had the privilege of being a part of their faith journey where they were not saved. They had not surrendered life to Christ and then they did, right? And so honestly, my faith for people to come to Christ is pretty high. Like I really, I know I've got room to grow, Okay, but it's pretty high. Like, I'm like, yeah, I, I don't, in the base level, do not struggle to believe people will come to Christ. I believe it. I, I want to see it more. I want to see it community-wide. I want to see it regionally. I want to see it nationally. I want to see it all over the world. So I know there's more faith to grow in, those, in, in believing for salvations and, and, and people to come to Christ. But in this area of healing, you know, I've seen trickles of people getting healed. I have, and, and you know, and and I'm thankful for those, and and creative miracles, and creative provision, and but I'm like, Lord, grow my faith. I believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. Even recently in my own life, there was a, a financial need, a provision need, and and I was just personally just pressing in for that. Shelly and I were, and and it's just so cool how God takes care of those things. And he did. He did. Within like two weeks, there was a breakthrough. It was amazing. And I'm like, God, I, I want to not just write that off as that, not that big a deal, but we prayed and we believed. And I believe he stretched our faith. And, and I believe I have another reason to believe again in even a greater measure than I did before. Wait a minute, God, you own it all. It's all yours. You know the needs and you love to meet needs. And, um, and so... I love this story, and I love what Spurgeon says about this process of our faith growing. He says this, while men have no faith, they are unconscious of their unbelief. But as soon as they get a little faith, then they begin to be conscious of the greatness of their unbelief. (laughs) Let me read that again. While men have no faith, they are unconscious of their unbelief. But as soon as they get a little faith, then they begin to be conscious of the greatness of their unbelief. So actually... I've, I've, that's an encouraging quote because he's saying, it, you know, you, if you have no faith, then you don't, you're not even, you have no awareness of your unbelief. But, but as soon as you get a little and, and you're in that being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, you're forming, you're growing, you're stretching. God is always wanting to stretch us and bring us to a greater level of faith. And as you do that, as you grow in your greater level of faith, as you and I are out doing what Jesus did, right? And we're out there praying for people and engaging with people and we're sharing the good news of the gospel and we're doing those, practicing the acts of service that he's called us to. We're loving and serving and blessing um, and we're seeing needs and we're meeting needs uh, in the name of Jesus, not to get credit, not for kudos, just because we're demonstrating the love of Christ in our community. He will give us faith opportunities, right? And I want to, I want to actually, if you pray for it today, God will, he'll bring one across your path. I promise you, you, you'll be amazed. Just say, God, give me eyes to see what you're up to and help me to partner with you in it. So, and then, and here's the last one, that greater faith leads to breakthrough. Let's finish the story. When Jesus saw that the crowd of onlookers was growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. He says, listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak. He said, I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. 
Yes. So he speaks to the spirit, tells him to come out of the boy, and boom, he does. It says, verse 26, it's pretty dramatic. It says, the spirit screamed through the boy into another violent convulsion and left him, but he gets, gets delivered. And the boy appeared to be dead, but a murmur ran through the crowd as people said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, helped him to his feet, and he stands up. The boy, free from that evil spirit, no more demonic possession or oppression, and boom, he's free. I just, ah. Uh, then, it, then it says, 28, afterward, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out that evil spirit? Verse 29, Jesus replies, this kind, this kind can be cast out only by prayer. And the New Living, it just says prayer. A lot of the translations just say prayer. Some translations say by prayer and fasting. So what we, what we know from this is that, uh, is that, first of all, I just want to say, imagine what the father was. Imagine what the boy's father. The boy is free. His father's like, my boy. <laughs> I mean, he saw it. He saw what I was right there. All right there. Disciples saw it. The crowd saw it. The, the religious leaders saw it. They saw what happened. And they're like, whoa, this boy is free. I mean, you gotta, you gotta imagine that the good news of Jesus, the love of Christ, was so clearly and tangibly demonstrated that people had to have been moved, impacted, hearts softened. And, um, and I just love that. I love that because greater faith leads to breakthrough. And when you and I see that faith grow, these kind of miracles start happening healings start happening, provisions start happening, things that can't be explained in natural, in natural ways, only in God's way happens. And why, and why is that good? Because God gets the glory and people see Jesus that didn't see him before. And even those who did see Jesus, they see him in a fresh light, a, a bigger light that he gets the glory and the honor and the praise. <laughs> ah. And then I love that it ends this way because they, in verse 29, when he says, well, you know, they're, 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 they're debriefing. The disciples are debriefing with Jesus. And Jesus is like, the disciples are like, why? We did what we thought we were supposed to do and it didn't work. Uh, why couldn't we cast out this evil spirit? And Jesus is like, this kind can be cast out only by prayer. So he's saying practically that even in, in the demonic realm, there are different seems to be different levels or ranks of spirits. And, and, and this one, specifically, this situation, you guys weren't prayed up enough. <laughs> and I don't, I don't exactly, he doesn't give us much more explanation, but I, there's something there where they weren't dependent enough, they weren't close enough, their, their, uh, their faith wasn't at a place where they really were, maybe they were just trusting in their own strength or in their own experience or their own past history. And they weren't really trusting. They weren't really believing. And so he's calling them up. He's saying, you need to engage in prayer more in this situation. You should have gone to prayer. It sounds it's kind of simple, but I, and I, there's mystery in it. I get it. But certainly we see we're, we're called to grow in our faith. We're called to grow deeper. We're called to go to see our faith stretched and, and pay attention to desperation. And so here's my question to wrap this up is, who do you relate with in this story? Who do you relate with in this story? Do you, do you relate with that boy who was bound and, and oppressed? And maybe you're listening to this and you just ran across this, this message and you're like, I relate with that boy. I feel bound up. I feel not free. I want to get free. Today's a good day for that. Maybe you're that, maybe you relate with the father and you've got to uh, a, a child or a situation or a spouse or a friend who's bound and, and you're desperate for breakthrough and maybe that's your situation. Maybe you maybe you're relate with the disciples. You're like, I, I'm, I'm doing this stuff, kind of, but I, or I'm a disciple of Jesus. I'm definitely saved, but I'm, I'm okay with being with Jesus. I'm okay be, trying to become like him and growing that way, but in that formation process, but the doing the stuff, the boldness to get out there and to engage in acts of service or, or, or a conversation or pray with people or, ah, it's a stretch. Imagine, I, I just challenge you this week to imagine yourself in that scene. Maybe go back and read this passage again and just kind of chew on it, think about it and, and, 
and say, Holy Spirit, show me th- what's blocking. Or maybe you're like one of the religious leaders. <laughs> and maybe you're like, I'm just on the outside being critical, pointing, pointing fingers, and like a whitewashed person. <laughs> a whitewashed tomb, Jesus calls them. I hope that's not you, but if that's you, you see it, that's huge because you can bring it to Jesus. So let me pray for you. Dear Jesus, I pray for all of us. Lord, everybody's a different spot. We relate with different people. Lord, if, if there's anybody that's listening to this that's bound up, I pray for their freedom. I pray, Jesus, that you would set them free. Lord, if there's someone who needs healing, I pray you'd heal them and that be healed in the name of Jesus. Whatever sickness, whatever infirmity, we believe. We believe. And if you're like, Kevin, I, I just, I believe what God wants to grow my faith, stretch it today. Lord, help, help each person tuning in that wants that. Stretch our faith, grow our faith, to trust you, to believe you for breakthrough. Ask all these things. And if you're, if you're not a Christian today, say yes to him. If you want to say yes to his grace gift, just say, yes, Jesus, I receive that grace gift. I give you my life. I surrender my life to you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you. Have a great week.